Hi, this is Josh. You might have noticed that this week's episode of Crim City is a little late. That's because we had the episode ready to go, all written, recorded and edited, and then one of Sydney's courts imposed a suppression order. It's taken a little while to work out exactly what we can and can't say, and we've had to cut out some of what we were saying, but not much. So now, with that out of the way, we can bring you this week's episode of Crim City. Welcome to Crim City. I'm Josh Hanrahan. I'm Mark Murray. Moz, this week we're going to break down a couple of front page stories, one from the 80s and one from far more recently. That's right. So gang wars of the 80s to the recent Hamzy Alamedine wars are both in the news and both even the old murder is a new murder. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going, to, we're going to cover that extensively, both of those today. So about 10 o'clock last night I get a phone call and... Uh, it's from one of my contacts, the Underworld guy, and he goes, Masood Zachariah, he's back. I go, what? He said, 100%, he's in, he's in Darwin. And uh, I thought, gee, I thought they'd never get this guy back. So I texted a few people, no one from the feds, no one from state police, no one was answering, all responding. Six o'clock this morning, phone goes, federal police media unit saying, there's going to be an alert going out about... The return we've got, Masood Zachariah, he's coming back, he's in the NT. And I said, yeah, thanks, you're about eight to ten hours behind <laughs> behind my bloke. But uh, Masood Zachariah, we've covered extensively, haven't we? You know you know a lot about him. Yeah, so this is huge news. Yeah. I, I, um, I woke up to your text at 2am. Yeah. Two, two yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I went to, um, I was out and about yesterday afternoon and in bed early preparing for today's show. <laughs> as per usual um, for a totally different topic yep. yeah and um, saw your text and went whoa but the fact that you know the, f- the fact that he'd been brought back to Darwin you go right this makes a lot of sense because it's where Mark Buttle came that was the where same Mark Buttle came back from Turkey now yeah. how he got to Turkey is very very interesting isn't he so Masood Zachariah to take it all the way back to the start came onto the scene of Sydney's underworld as a teenager when he joined up with Brothers for Life. I reckon he, he must have been 18, 19 or, or 20. a young member of, yeah, a, a street gang it was then. Yeah, so, you know, this is a guy, his family originates from Afghanistan, um, immigrated to uh, Australia. He had probably not the easiest upbringing. And then, you know, the, the first time he really comes on the scene is when there's uh, a knock on his door and there isn't an it's answer. It's about 2013, isn't it? Also? Yeah, it'd be about, it'd be about that, it'd almost exactly. Because that's yeah. when... Help. So there's, there's a knock on his door and there's not an answer, but there's some, when there's no answer, there's shots fired through the door and they hit a, a young relative of Masood Zachariah. Um, the bullets hit, hit that young relative and leave her injured. There was a lot of shootings going around that time. As, uh, 2013, as I said, people now go, wow, Sydney's out of control. 2013, there were bikey blues. There were a lot more shootings. So um, just to put in context, yeah. Brothers for Life were new, very new on the scene. Yes, and he, he'd formed up. He joined Brothers for Life, that Which, street gang run by the Hamseys. And that's an interesting thing to just park, is that Masood Zachariah initially... That's 10 years ago. 10 years ago was yeah. part of the Hamsey gang, which was Brothers for Life at that point. Anyway, fast forward and... Um, he pops up on the scene again in recent years as one of the alleged, alleged yeah. thank you, <laughs> chief lieutenants of the Alan Bedeen crime plan. Um, he is virtually police alleged Rafat Alan right hand man. In particular, there is one incident that police reckon he is. You know, they char- well, well, they, they will charge him for in the coming they days. They took out a warrant. Anyway, Masood Zachariah. In December of 2021, somehow gets Did wind you? that police are about to knock on his door. And we've spoken about this before on a, on a previous podcast, I'm sure. So police plan this morning of raids in which they're going to arrest a number of, a number of, of alleged members, members yep. of the Alameda crime clan over various alleged acts of criminality. But... When they went to get him, as I said, in December of 2021, he wasn't home. He wasn't home. He yeah. cleared his, sh- his cupboards out. As I said, I heard there were, weren't even running shoes left. No. 
and he vanished. There were four that they didn't get, weren't there? And, yeah. And Masood Chief amongst them? Yes. It's an incredible little um, time span in Sydney's underworld war yeah. that we talk about. We talk a lot about the shootings or the kidnappings, but this this vanishing act is, is quite incredible. And, and then we believe uh, he then made his way Yes. on a slow boat. Yeah, to, so you got to remember, at that time, December 2021, 20, middle of COVID lockdown, goes off and ends up in the Middle East in Turkey. In Turkey, yeah. Where is which is hanging out with everyone. And yeah, then, which is a safe haven, you know. Well, he, was, he, he, be- he believed at that yeah. point, and many people believed. He goes to Turkey and he's living abroad for the best part of a year before he's detained over there in early 2023. Now, the, the stories I got told were that, you know, those boys were just running amok. Running amok, there, there yeah. was There was, you know... There were fights there in were gyms. Fights in gyms. Stuff like that. Yep. And there were people, like, remember there was um, Erkan Keskin? Yes. Eric the Wolf was over there. We've talked about he he's he was out of control. Like, he died after a six-day party bender. Yeah. And so the Turkey, as I said before, has long been seen as a country where you can go to without any concern for yeah. international law enforcement. But what... As long as you've got plenty of coin. As long as you 100% yeah. to pay your way. But clearly what's happened is that there's been a change... In government, government or it's coming up to an election, I think it was. It was, and yeah. and there was a, a change in attitude at least, and so they've detained Masood Zakaria, who is wanted on Interpol notices, and so they detain him in January of this year, twenty twenty three. January. So I was yeah. trying to figure out. He's, I'll be honest, I, I didn't think they'd bring him back. Mm. I really thought because you got to remember, he's the the he's an Afghani, right? Citizen. So yeah, citizen. So. I was thinking this guy might be able to get his get out of coming being deported back to Australia by maybe trying to go to Afghanistan and then from there take off. Uh, you know, I got we got to give the authorities their due here. I didn't think, and I don't think many people thought. In fact, nearly everybody thought Buttle will never come back and is now facing trial for uh, drug importation. Yeah, but he he used to. Be allegedly the, the head of the commander of the Comanchero Biker Club. Even when he was arrested in Cyprus and then taken to Turkey. Yeah, well, that that part of northern Cyprus that is essentially governed yeah. by Turkey. Turkey. So this is two big players that Turkey has now put on planes and deported back to Australia. So Australia. Also, in all this mix, we've had Hakan Ayik arrested, um, who is the Mister Big. Like he's an international. Um, drug dealer massively with massive links here to Sydney people thought he was untouchable he's still locked up in, in Turkey admittedly and police here quietly just said he, he won't come back here but he's well, I wonder what they'll say today though because that, that that is I but he's a Turk too. but he's a Turk you see that's the big difference and that's you know and there's also little Hux yeah there's, but there's just and you're probably right You've had them grab Buttle in Turkey and now Zachariah and send them both yeah. back. And you've had them even have the guts to detain Aik. Aik, yeah. Right. Uh, like, if you said before Mark Buttle got grabbed that in the next 18 months they'll have deported Buttle and Zachariah and have put Hack and Aik in a jail cell, you'd say you're an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. That's. So it's interesting. Yeah, it is. But it, Masood Zakharari, because of his alleged influence over the Alamedines and the impact that has had on Sydney's streets in recent years, he, I would think, would be the number one Do you think the first question New the police. New South Wales police will be sitting down there and going, so how did you know that we were coming to say hello to you? It's a, it is, it's a big question. It is huge. So, it, but that you is, know what's pissed me off about the whole thing? I had to, about them getting Zachariah? No. I had this huge, great story on page one. Today? Uh, yes. I haven't read the paper today. Well, so here. A gangster's graveyard. Fantastic exclusive. Yeah. All right? And it was top of our website, and it's bumped at 6.30 when you filed Masood Zachariah. But this is it. So we're going to go from... So is this your segue into this story? Yes. Okay. Does I it just work? To say, it does, but I just wanted to say <laughs> that Masood Zachariah, you know, will be extradited from, as you sit here... Darwin, he'll come here to Sydney. Yep. And he'll be charged with conspiracy to murder and der- several counts of directing a criminal group. Criminal group, yeah. And I dare say he'll be refused bail. We'll see what happens. Yeah, come on, your front page. Tell me all okay. about it. Okay. 
I haven't read the paper yet, so take it from the top. So, well, we'll start off by, I was reporting in the 80s, so there was the gangland war, so I know... 1880s or 1980s? <laughs> That's not bad for you. But, um, so, yeah, so, and I remember that um, there was a lot going on. I was a young reporter, and um, there were people being shot left, right and centre. Not quite to the extent we've had here now, but, but what they did back then... Unlike now where they go in guns blazing in gyms and yeah. in the streets, people were just vanishing. You, and there'd be, we didn't get press releases though, they'd be, um, they'd bring up and go, oh, so-and-so's missing, there's grave concerns for him. And now I know why they say grave, because they were in graves. Yeah. <laughs> and Jeez. so what's just happened in, to take you back, so we've got this gangland war and a number of people just went missing, vanished, you know, whether they went on the run or, or whatever, but we now know that they were, they were killed. Right, so in 2007, Sydney was running out of water, apparently. Um, we're ready to, you know, we're all going to dehydrate to the point where we spend a few billion dollars building a desalination plant. Oh, did you? Yeah. Down yeah. at Kernel. So Vic Kernel, Sand Dunes. Victoria got one down at um, One Thaggy. Where's One Thaggy? Mm. Oh, okay. Um, That's, that'll probably get cut, won't it? Yeah, so it should. Um, so, yeah, the desal plant has been, you know, we're worried about our water supply, so it's been doing, digging up sand dunes. When the workers notice what is, looks like a shin bone, and it obviously looks human. Work stops, cops come in, um, make a crime scene, gather as much as they can up over a couple of days. Um, it's a massive site. So they have these bones. And then I, I think no one really knew. So the anthropologists, you know, people were saying that it could be a burial site. It could, be, could belong to Aboriginal but sacred site from a long time ago. No one knew. And then, oh, I forget, a few years later, I'm told there are three, they, they've identified that these are bones. Mm -hmm. There was a chupa chup wrapper or something that was found with oh, really? near it so that made it contemporary yeah right then there was a sock too and there weren't many socks around it, even Back in then. the 1880s when i was covering that first gangland war with the <laughs> rum rebellion um so anyway we we then um the, the cop said so we now believe that we have two maybe three victims and then they were thinking so they're trying to figure out what was happening. So they believe that this the site of three. So they then got warrants. They actually took DNA from the son of Christopher Dale Flannery, who went missing, I think, in 1985. A notorious hitman believed to have tried to kill undercover cop Mick Drury with Roger Rogerson. He also was known to have killed a few people. Seriously bad, man. Seriously bad. So they got a warrant to, to try and match the DNA, which is how they had to do it. That didn't work. That I know that they tried. They got they tried to match whether Lynn um, Woodward, who was a young woman, who had the balls to actually stand up at a coroner's court investigate um, hearing, and say I have information about corrupt police, and she was going to name Roger Rogerson and Nettie Smith, who was notorious criminal, probably Sydney's biggest criminal at the time, who was running around with Roger Rogerson, shooting people, doing all sorts of things. And uh, so they were going to... She walked out of the coroner's court to come back at a later date, never to be seen again. Mm. And it's quite... Uh, everyone believes that Roger Rogerson and Nettie Smith picked her up, took her, and, and that's the last that was ever seen of her. Is that in Blue Murder? Uh, is there a scene of that in Blue would Murder? That would be, because that was not a story that very many people... Uh, maybe I haven't watched Blue Murder for a long time. It's a scene in something. Maybe it's the more modern one, the Rogerson one. Maybe I don't know. But I've seen. I've seen, I just remember that yeah. scene where she walks out of the coroner's. Because that, that was after Sally after Ann. Because Sally Ann or oh. Sally Ann Huckstep, who was her flatmate, yeah, had also given evidence, oh, okay. and she's then found dead in. A, a pond at Centennial Park. Maybe that's what I'm getting confused yeah. with. Yeah. So anyway, we've got these bones, and police have got one, and they've tried to match them against certain missing persons and stuff. Nothing came about it. But then there's a change in legislation in 2019, which allows police to match DNA against databases, 
Whereas previously it had to be, it was really tricky legally that you couldn't just do a wide sweeping. So 2019, one of these bones comes back and it's matched to a guy called Mark Johnson. 1986, Mark Johnson, part-time model, but bigger time cocaine dealer. He goes missing, big news. I remember covering it back then, I'm sent to one of the last places he was seen alive. He um, was last known to be going to visit the Nettie Smith's solicitor at Bellevue Hill, a guy called Val Bellamy, and he was supposed to be going there and there's something about $60,000 he was going to give him or something. Uh, and that was the last he was really seen, except for they then found his car a couple of days later abandoned uh, in the eastern suburbs with a little bit of cocaine, cocaine in it. And then there was this, you know, massive story. I remember being sent the last place, he, one of the places he last seen was a Bellevue Hotel at um, Paddington. I got sent along there. Great, Bob. Yeah, great. I went in there to start asking about Mark Johnson, having a few beers, and then these two big blokes came up and said, mate, out of here, because they were mates of his. Yeah. So I got thrown out of that pub without having a drink. Hey. Now, that's unusual. It's a nice change. It is a nice change. So these bones have come back as Mark Johnson's, all right, in 2019. Uh, a coroner had already found that Mark Johnson had been killed, most likely at Val Bellamy's place, uh, by Nettie Smith and believed he was garroted, right? Because Nettie's picked up on a secret recordings years later saying, yeah, I had to be careful not to get any blood on Val Bellamy's wife's new carpet. Mm. So not, not a nice person. So there, there we have. We've got one of these bones identified. So... What we haven't known is for the last couple of years, though, police also know another set of bones. Have they identified them as belonging to a guy called Paul Norton. Now, Paul Norton... This is your story today. This is a story today. So they've revealed after, you know, three, four years that they know this guy, Paul Norton. They've been investigating this whole thing. But, but this goes back to the 80s, so it's, it's, it does, yeah, it's he, about four decades since yeah. he died, right? Well, he, he went missing in 1989. But yep. his bones are now found in a bunch of bones with Mark Johnson, who we everybody says has been killed by Nettie Smith. Now, Paul yep. Norton goes missing in 1989 after being at a footy match with his two young kids he'd separated. Uh, he then went and saw his girlfriend, then went and met a mate at Homebush and then never seen again, 1989. Now his bones have turned up next to Mark Johnson's and Nettie was in jail hmm. when he went missing. So it can't have been Nettie. So it can't have been Nettie. So it's intriguing. Now, what these cops have been able to do in the last couple, they've drilled right down into Paul Norton. You remember, he was a guy, he's only 31 at the time he went missing. He came from the country town of Young. Mm -hmm. uh, he went and got a job. His first job was at a butcher shop in Botany. Now, that was part owned by a guy called Dr. Nick Paltos. Now, this doctor... <laughs> uh, ended up probably being one of the biggest criminals Sydney's ever seen. He was wow. a massive importer of drugs. He was linked to corrupt cops, corrupt politicians, you name it. He was involved in it, involved in some of the biggest importations. And this guy goes and works in that butcher shop and things seem to go downhill from there. He's ended up separating it with, from his wife, two kids, goes and works in another butcher shop. But unbeknownst, um, when I was digging into this and talking to some police and some other people. At the time he went missing, he was under investigation by the Drug Enforcement Agency, which was a drug squad, basically, that we had here. And nobody knew who this guy was, but he was playing around with some really big hitters. Now, some of the names that he was allegedly linked to and allowed to name for, for legal reasons, because they're still alive. Like Roger Rogerson. Well, we can say Roger. I don't care about Roger. Roger's a convicted killer. We can't. Do you think he killed this boy? No, I don't. Roger, I don't, I don't think Roger did a lot of the, a lot of the, those, those sort of killings. But for the, I think there are some other, some other guys who are actually just locked up now, and they're not as old as you think. Yeah. Um, so the reason police think these are linked are obviously because they were all found at the same location. There's but, that, but also. Even though Mark, even though Norton and Johnson didn't know each other, up there, it, it was called the Eastern Suburbs Melu, right? There are a whole, a whole lot of guys, and some of the names mentioned to me were guys who were well known. I know that they were involved in fucking shootouts, drive, yeah, like right. literally down Anzac Parade. So, so they had links to big players up higher? Yes. 
but the fact that their bones are found together, I guess that also would make you think that somebody knows that that's a place, because it's years apart. Three years, yeah. So it would make you think that somebody knows that that's the place where we'd put the other bones. So there'd yeah. have to be some link to the previous crimes, you right? you think that, or was poor Nettie maligned over the murder of Mark Johnson? And the, you know what I mean? Yeah, that throws okay. up some theories. That's um, interesting. Yeah, because there's that potential. Um, yeah, right. That he didn't do it. Or the person that was who helped, you know, Nettie. Even though Nettie's a big, strong bastard, he probably needed help. He would have had a, yeah. Help so on. did that person go, oh, yeah, we'll just dump it back there. But that's been solid for three years. What? Yeah. Again, this is what used to happen. See, Flannery's never been found. These two guys, it's taken you know, a long, long time. If it wasn't for the desal plant, we still wouldn't have wouldn't it. Wouldn't know. Um, but what, these modern guys don't do that. Yeah. We used to have this famous saying, like, last thing drinking, like they'd lure them to meetings and then they'd never be seen again. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's why there was um, two sets of bones attributed to Nettie again, found over at Foreshore Drive, which is a long way apart, but directly across the bay from Botany Bay from Cornell. Oh, really? That Roger did. One was a guy called uh, Harvey Jones, brothel owner. I think yeah. Nettie ended up doing... Uh, he got convicted of that one. There was another one called Bruce Sandry, or that they believe he did. But it just shows you they they, they put a lot more effort into it. I mean, these it's, guys go in guns blazing. It's quite fascinating, as you say, isn't it? Yeah, it, just the difference. Yeah. And interestingly, the coppers went um, while Nettie's on his deathbed and took a photo along of Paul Norton you know, he's, and said, do you know him? Not so much did you kill him, but do you know him? Trying to find some connection. And the owner they said that was about the one sensible answer they got from from Nettie, he said, no, I've got nothing. So you wouldn't be able to believe a word Nettie said, you know. No, you know? no. But it brings up that... And, but as I said, I, these guys, you know, you think it's a, a 35-year-old murder. It's a murder. There's no way this... You think it's never going to yeah. be solved. Interesting. When they found, they found his car three weeks later after he went missing, his girlfriend reported him missing, at a um, Hertz rental car out at Sydney... Uh, depot out at Sydney Airport full of sand... I suppose nowadays you'd be able to match that DNA, that sand to what's down at Cornell. Yeah. So, but I, I think that they believe that potentially the killer's alive, you know? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I do. I, I, they're not saying a lot. They're obviously keeping it undercover. But some of the guys he was, as I said, some of the people he was mixing with who were deeply involved in, in those underworld wars in the 80s, some of the I, are still around so it's it's a great story it is thanks for listening to Crim City I'm Josh Hanrahan I'm Mark Murray you can catch us here weekly also daily on the dailytelegraph.com.au and on TikTok and YouTube as well Moz that's going to be our final episode of this season we'll take a little break over Christmas and New Year and come back next year thank you for all your stories and your knowledge it's been a lot of fun yeah it's been fun going through everything all over again and mixing it all with the new that's that's the best part I think we found is that the old stuff mixes in with the new quite quite well. It's yeah, we've gone yeah. through Lily James's murder, Horror you know, the missing children, um, yeah. some updates to the gang war, the, the big arrests of Hacken Aik and Bill Al Houcher overseas. So it's been a big, and that's, big yeah. eight weeks. Yeah. And we'll be back next year. Thanks as always to the team, Dan Box, Jasper Leek and Nina Young. And if you have any topics that you want us to cover in the future, you can find us at joshua.hanrahan at news.com.au or mark.murray at news.com.au. Very good. Right? I, like I was it. testing you. I know you were. I'm not, or Instagram. Or what about my mobile phone if you're... No, that's <laughs> Stop that bit. I'm married. <laughs>